different chaplains have different <laughs> ways of doing this, but you know, we're not necessarily the best at the self-promotion or the marketing or service. And, you know, but to be able to like lean into, lean into the lean, lean into the methodologies, you know, it sort of gives us that, you know, that it isn't just that we're like promoting ourselves. It's actually, we're looking at, you know, um, looking at the data and we're being able to tell that, like I said, you know, tell that story in a different way. So I think it really is a nice tool um, for folks who, who may not know exactly how to, you know, paint that picture. Hey everybody, I'm Elizabeth Swan. And I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and we're from the Just In Time Cafe. Welcome to our podcast. At the cafe, we wrestle with tough questions. We talk to groundbreakers. We discuss great books, and we get insights from Lean Six Sigma practitioners who are making a difference in the world. We also let you in on helpful apps, we bring you the news, and we challenge the status quo so you can build your problem solving muscles. So Elizabeth, what is on the cafe menu? Oh, Tracy, today's highlight is our interview with Allison Kessenbaum, the Supervisor of Spiritual Care and Clinical Pastoral Education at UC San Diego Health. She just got her Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certification from a certain instructor that I know. So we're going to dig into the intersection of continuous improvement and spiritual care. And I'll bet that's a new one for everyone out there. So stay tuned. And then for hot apps, we'll cover an app that gives you credit. We all like getting credit and being recognized. And then we'll cover a book that recently got some credit. And the author just happens to be one of the hosts of this podcast. So stay tuned for a gold medal reveal, Tracy. <laughs> in the meantime, make yourself some just-in-time coffee and let's roll. Up next is Hot Apps. Yes, today's app is Credly, which is all about credentialing. Uh, it's an electronic badging app that promises to help build cultures of recognition we are all about recognition because it can be a powerful engine for employee acknowledgement. Some learners appreciate the ease with which they can showcase their achievements and skills with digital uh, digital badges. So the idea is that the more the more clearly you can demonstrate your core competencies and skills and strengths, the more employable you'll be. And there are other apps out there, but Credly seems to have the most credibility um, based on the customers we spoke with. They're great to deal with, and we suspect the model we're describing would be true for other vendors. So benefits, um, we heard that the, you know, the badges provide evidence of a person's level of learning. Um, they're shareable on social media, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, and uh, Facebook. Badges are not associated with a particular job, so they travel with you, and they become part of your digital resume. And then there's benefits to, to an organization that uses the app. So what'd you find out about that end of the app, Tracy? Well, as instructors, we've seen these play with the institutions we work with. UC San Diego Extended Studies uses it, and our colleague, Karen Martin of the TKMG Academy, uses Credly as well. And I have heard a lot of other organizations using it as well. For both these institutions, UCSD and TKMG, having people share their accomplishments helps spread the word on the courses they offer. And there's other, a couple of other benefits. Badges considerably cut down on the time, materials, and expense of printing and issuing physical awards. For the university, students seem to really like the badges, and it's definitely a selling point. I mean, who wouldn't want to share digitally, you know, that you are doing really well or that you, you had an accomplishment? And here's some stats for UC San Diego. Since January 2023, they've issued 252 Lane Six Sigma badges. The Greenbelt badge acceptance rate is 82%. The share rate is 91%. The Black Belt badge acceptance rate is 84%. And the share rate is 86%. Not bad. I'm sure it's because we're teaching some of these courses, but no doubt. <laughs> For sure. Of course. Of course, Tracy. That's a driving factor. Um, but one thing that occurs to me is that the type of badge makes a difference. Like having a green belt or a black belt, you know, has industry recognition. There's still no governing body. That's a separate issue. But there is name recognition. And there's only three or four potential badges, right? White, yellow, green, black. Um, and employers have a good shot at knowing what each of those means. So 
in contrast, at the TKMG Academy, badges are for individual courses like your process walks course, Tracy, or my creating a visual workplace course. And they've had success with Credly. But for super learners, I was thinking that's like a lot of badges to post on something like their LinkedIn profile. And that reminds me of my father's like Eagle Scout sash. I remember I found that at some point, you know, and his goal was to fill up his sash with badges, right? I mean, I remember seeing things like, you know, not tying, <laughs> you know, all these things that um, he was able to put those on his sash. And I asked Karen Martin about that. And she said, they're starting a super badge this month, right? So it's almost like an Eagle Scout sash. So we can check to see how that works out. Um, and the process of using Credly, that's also kind of interesting, Tracy. What'd you, what'd you discover there? Well, yes, from the learner's perspective, they take the course and when they pass, they get congrats emails from the institution and an option to accept their badge. If they accept, then Credly takes over the process and invites the learner to set up a free account. They can make their badge public and they can opt to share it on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever they want. want. Did, did, did you try it out, Elizabeth? I did. I was talking to Karen and she said, why don't you go see if you can earn a badge? So I was like, okay. So I went on to TKMG Academy and you know what I course I took, Tracy, was your process walks course. <laughs> and I got to say, you are not a bad instructor. <laughs> You're such a good teacher. I got 100 on the final exam and I earned a badge. Um, and it was, uh, that was great. And I cannot deny, even though, you know, I know you, we've talked process walks for our, you know, I don't know how many decades together. Um, but I got that adrenaline spike from being told that, you know, I scored high. I got congrats on my achievement. You know, humans are, we're kind of predictable in our response to affirmation, right? We get a hit of dopamine and I can see getting addicted to badges, Tracy. So Credly might be addictive for learners. So um, how did you, how does the pricing work for hosts? Yes. I, and I'll just say one comment about that too. I agree. I think Credly is a great concept because people do need to ha have those little achievements, those little dopamine hits along the way. And you know, just like when I do pickleball tournaments, you know, everybody wants the little medal and, and they get a shirt too, but I like the medals way better than the shirts, right? Okay, so let's talk pricing. It's an interesting setup. Pricing is based on the number of earners a company has. And an earner is someone who gets 70% or better as a score, whether they accept their badge or not. So it encourages customers to get learners to download badges. The pricing we would access lists the following. 500 earners equals 2,500 a year. 1,000 badges equal 4,500 a year. 2,500 badges for 7,500 a year. 5,000 for 10,000 a year. 5,000 badges for 10,000 a year. And 10,000 badges for 20,000 a year. But if you got 10,000 badges you're issuing, you can afford 20,000 a year. <laughs> do that. You do that. We'll include links to both the TKMG Academy of our dear colleague, Karen Martin, and UC San Diego Extended Studies Lean Six Sigma Portfolio, two awesome institutions with great courses and amazing instructors. <laughs> it's true. I'm Elizabeth Swan, and you're listening to the Just in Time Cafe podcast in a short while. You'll get to hear our interview with hospital chaplain Allison Kessenbaum at UC San Diego Health. Today we're switching up because my friend and co-host Elizabeth got some recognition this month. It's kind of a book badge in a way. Talking about dopamine hits and from um, affirmations, Elizabeth, can you describe your reaction to the announcement that your book had won gold for best business book of 2023? Oh, Tracy, I know you like bling, but I have to say this was like this was like digital bling uh, finding this out. So the it was kind of a scene like I got the email from Reader Views just saying that they had announced their winners from 2023. And I clicked the link, I did a little scan, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm a long shot. And then Mark Graven sent me congrats from that same email, because he's he'd entered his book too. So I rechecked the email, and then I scanned properly um, a, a ways, because I had to get through things like, you know, best, you know, fiction, young adult, spiritual, like there was, you know, there's a lot of categories. And then I found the business category, and, and, it, and my name was at the top with gold next to it. <laughs> 
I cannot tell you the experience, Tracy, because I started running around the house. Oh, actually, I had to go wake my husband up. I'd gotten up really early, so I was upstairs looking at um in my office. And then I ran downstairs and I woke him up and I was like, honey, you've got to get up. I won the gold. So he's like, what? What are you talking about? So then as soon as I got him, like, you know, to join me at breakfast, I just kept running around like the house with my hands in the air going, I won the gold. I won the gold. <laughs> and I, was, I was just trying to make him laugh, which I try to do that a lot. Um, and he was laughing. But I know I was also like fueled by norepinephrine or something. Um and then even later in the day, he's like, can you help, you know, make some guacamole for dinner? And I was like, you mean gold metal guacamole? <laughs> so it's like David Letterman, like beating a joke into the ground. So it bounced back again. But then, you know, jokes aside, the other thing this award brought up for me was wanting to share it. And you, Tracy, are one of the first people I told about that. And I did that because I knew you'd be happy for me. And, and and you were so, you were awesome. But I really wanted to run and tell my mom, right? I, I And you know, she recently passed away, so I couldn't, but she was the best person to tell you'd done something good. You know, she just lit up about hearing your accomplishments and I wrote about it and it reminded me of our topic today, right? So getting acknowledged and sharing accomplishments. Um, and you're really good at acknowledging others, Tracy. I feel like that's one of your strengths. So how do you encourage that, like with leaders you help? Yeah, great question. And thank you. Um, and you knew I would be happy for you. Genuinely happy for you, my friend. Yeah. So happy to see you succeed, which I'm going to be honest right now. You know, I have some friends that aren't happy for me sometimes. And that is a clear red flag too, by the way, right? Like, why am I friends with people that can't be happy for me? Like, you know, a true friend would be very happy for you. So anyway, I, um, you know, I actually got this question from someone this this last week about how do you stay motivated? How do you help keep others motivated? And I think you're right. I do this naturally, but the reason why is, and, and many of you may be familiar with this, strength finders. One of my number one, my strongest strength is positivity. And so it is very natural for me to be positive. And when I share that with people, you know, about, you know, um, acknowledging people and sharing accomplishments, the comment I hear back is, well, that's not who I am though. And I'm going to come across as disingenuous. So I don't want to do it. And okay, I get that, but you still need to do it. And I don't want you to come with something fake. Like don't, I'm not telling you to be fake. You truly have to find something to acknowledge and appreciate people for. You can't m pretend because that is terrible. That would be disingenuous and not true. And I'm not asking you to be that. Just recognize things a little bit more. Recognize people, recognize good work. Because honestly, in the world today, we are, m most people are bombarded with what they're doing wrong, not just by leaders, but they're telling themselves, right? They're telling themselves, what am I doing wrong? They're beating themselves up. And it's always kind of nice to hear that you have a leader that is encouraging and supportive. And I always say, be specific, be specific about something. Don't be like, great job every day. Great job, people get to work. It just feels, it does feel disingenuous. So there is a fine line and it is important. And just because you're not good at it does not give you an excuse not to do it. Just work yeah. on getting better at it. Yeah, true words, Tracy, and really good specific advice about being specific. Um, and, you know, I just think about when I coach people and I can see them light up when I tell them what they're doing right, right? They, and they're, they're relieved because they're doing what you described was they assume they're doing it wrong and they're beating themselves up. So I can see the relief like, oh, I'm not doing it wrong. So that's all the negativity bias we have. So we naturally look for what's not working, both in other people and ourselves. It's very prevalent. So I'm not handing out gold medals, but it doesn't take much for people to feel good. And we can make it happen every day. Every day. I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. We host these monthly. So you can go to www.jitcafe.com. That's www.jitcafe.com and go to our podcast page. Coming up next, it's our featured guest, Allison Kessenbaum. Tracy, could you tell our listeners a little bit about Allison? Yes, I would love to. Allison Kessenbaum, 
uh, is a board certified chaplain and the supervisor of spiritual care and clinical pastoral education at UC San Diego Health. She conducts research about spiritual and palliative care and education. She was also a student of mine in the UCSD Health Black Belt course. And I really enjoyed working with her and I loved her project and how she applied this so much that I asked her to come to the cafe to share how uh, she came across her project and what she did. And we are honored to have her at the cafe. Welcome, Allison. Yes, thank you so much for joining us at the cafe to talk about how Lean Six Sigma can intersect with spiritual care. We're very excited to talk with you. Congrats on your new status as a Lean Six Sigma black belt. Woo, woo. <laughs> During your project presentation, you had a lot of support. You had, you know, your your peers, other chaplains come for your presentation. And you are one of the first chaplains that I've known. And I don't know, Elizabeth, does that resonate with you too? That is a Lean Six Sigma black belt? First one. <laughs> You're a groundbreaker. It's an honor yes. to blaze the trail with such great support. <laughs> So um, tell us and our audience a little bit about what you do at UCSD Health. Sure. Um, so you let the cat out of the bag that I'm a chaplain. And um, I know some people know what that word means or they've heard it in certain contexts. But um, in healthcare, chaplains have been involved in healthcare for a really long time. There is a recognition that when people are going through a health crisis, that it raises all kinds of um, questions about the meaning of our life, our purpose, our important relationships, our sense of community, all of those, all of those things. And that's why chaplains are are there. And one thing that people are sometimes surprised to hear is that we provide care to folks of all backgrounds. So it could be people from particular religious backgrounds, but also people who are spiritual but not religious, people who consider themselves, you know, affiliated with no particular uh, religious background. Uh, so we, um, we just really try to meet people where they're at and, uh, help them feel more whole as they go through or be seen as, you know, cared for as whole people as mm -hmm. they go through their, uh, their, their, hopefully their healing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So here's the question of the hour. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of folks would say, you know, okay, how do you apply process improvement to spiritual care? You know, what kinds of processes exist in spiritual care at UC San Diego Health? So I I might be a little bit biased on this. I, um, in graduate school, I got two different degrees. One degree was in you know religious studies and the other degree was a master's in public administration. So that kind of tells you a little bit about my kind of orientation and how I approach the world that, you know, I have this like great sense of awe for the, <clears throat> you know, things that are happening around us that we don't fully understand, but, you know, give our lives, you know, such richness. And then there's also part of me that really appreciates processes and structures and, you know, um, ways of setting, you know, policies and procedures that promote efficiency. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think, what, what started some of it, um, you know, to be able to bring those bring those two interests together. So it makes a lot of sense to me, at least. And, you know, we are um, being spiritual caregivers in healthcare. Um, you know, like any department, we need to be able to demonstrate the impact that we're having, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think qualitatively, people can really understand it. And there are so many great anecdotes um, you know, of hopefully when our team has been able to help people going through a difficult time, um, you know, find some comfort or peace. And we can put numbers to that, you know, to also enhance that story. Um, and I think that the the Black Belt really helped me to use some of those methods to tell that, to really broaden that story. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you noticed as your instructor, <laughs> but I took an extreme interest in your position and how you're applying this. And that's actually one of the things I love about my job is, you know, I have, I haven't seen this applied and in the 25 years I've done this, I haven't seen it applied to spiritual care. So 
I was really interested and I know you were struggling a little bit at first, like how is this going to apply? And I really was spending time thinking about that. And I, what I love about this concept is obviously process improvement applies in healthcare and you know taking care of the body and the processes that we do in hospital to take care of the patient administer pharmace pharmaceuticals those kinds of things but this is about whole person care right you've got your medical and physical body care and then you have the mental the spiritual the soul even and so Tell us a little bit about the journey you had into process improvement and finding your Black Belt project. Right. Well, um, I definitely felt that that interest and that support, that sense of, you know, being uh, that you were sticking with me as I was discerning what how I was going to put this topic into these terms. I, in retrospect, I would say that um, the the challenges were actually, I think, probably similar resistance that we see in many Black Belt projects where folks might have a desire to kind of, they come in knowing what they think the countermeasure is going to be, right? So like, I came in knowing what I wanted to do. But in fact, I, you know, if I were to have implemented that, I would have not had the benefit of going through the whole process, you know, mm -hmm. of actually, you know, developing the problem statement and, you know, investigating what the root cause was. Because once I trusted the process, it actually became clear that, you know, there was um, a way that, you know, spiritual care could be, um, you know, that these methodologies could be used for spiritual care. So I think it really, you know, that kind of, we say this in our world all the time, spiritual care education, trust the process. But I think that's really true in, in this world as well. Mm -hmm. So so now I'm just, my brain is buzzing in terms of like uh, the challenges that you're, you're experiencing, like how you narrow down uh, the right challenge that you could, like you mentioned metrics, right? Mm -hmm. So what did you measure? Um, in terms right. of the challenge you were facing. Yeah. Well, it's funny because we are actually now circling back to what that sort of dream project was that I had. But, but you know, we're, we, we had to go in the right process, I think, or the right steps. And so what, our, what the project was um, is um, screening for spiritual pain in uh, an ICU. Um, at what's called downgrade. So you can imagine being in an ICU impacts people on every possible level. And one of the things that we wanted to do was understand how they under how they themselves understood their level of spiritual suffering when they were being downgraded to a, a less intense level of care. And so, um, you know, the sort of project that I thought I was coming in with was something about um supporting the well-being of staff right and so these these topics may seem completely unrelated but part of what we found in the project was that um you know clinicians are so focused on the patient as they should be right that's what, i think that's what we all want as patients right mm -hmm. and so to come to a to a clinician and say hey i think you really should take you know you deserve to have your own well-being and resilience and your own you know connection to your spiritual life they might say, okay, maybe, but what about the patient? And so I think that we found by looking at, um, you know, um, it sort of had this double benefit of being able to screen. And we do spiritual screening for um, as many patients as we can. That's pretty typical in healthcare. And actually the Joint Commission um, even encourages and requires that. Um, but this was a, a specific measure that we were using. And what we found um, is that in measuring the rate at which, um, let's say, bedside nurses were asking this spiritual pain question, this validated spiritual pain question, that we were actually finding that they were becoming more fluent in their own relationship with their spirituality as caregivers, right? And so ultimately, now we're seeing just more dialogue about that on the unit and you know, even greater collaboration with the spiritual care team in that particular ICU, which is really, um, you know, that's kind of what I hoped for. And so it was really great to see that, that, you know, measurement could bring us to that, to that outcome. Wow. Nice. nice. Yes. So if we were to be super concise on the problem statement for your Black Belt project, it is, tell us what that was. 
So the problem um, statement was um, that, you know, we know that many patients, as I mentioned, you know, there's significant psychospiritual, um, social, psychosocial distress that happens in the ICU. And we know that spiritual um, pain can have an impact also on, you know, physical healing. And so um, what the problem statement was is that we had implemented this validated tool in April 2023. This was, you know, before um, before the Black Belt Project even, or maybe around the same time before I knew that this was actually going to be the project. We were working on this separately. And, you know, what we found was that three weeks into the implementation of the screening screening tool, we were maybe at about 20% of downgraded patients were being screened. Um, by December of last year, we were down to zero, which is not not the best, not the most fun thing to admit. But you know what was good about it was that th it was just so clear um, that when we implemented the countermeasure that we found through you know the root cause analysis, um, we we saw such a drastic increase. We got up to like seventy percent. Um, but that initial problem statement was that we had the screening was down to you know zero to 20 percent over the course of those you know not eight to nine months mm -hmm. so since like tracy i'm you know constantly coaching projects and one of the tricky things with everyone not just you know someone in uh the spiritual part of the hospital processes but a lot of people struggle with measurements and how to assess whether they what the baseline is and how they would know they improved something um, and so that's a real process. So I appreciate you going through that process. And the other thing I'm constantly fascinated by is what turns out to be the root cause or root causes. And often people have sort of suspicions going in and then they discover something completely different or um, or kind of a deeper level uh, that they didn't see at first. So I'm curious for you, would, would you have some surprises about the root causes for the low screening? Uh, yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure if it was a surprise. I think it really comes down to the fact that um, we had a lot of support. You know, I would go to these, like, um, they call it a unit-based practice council where, you know, nurses and other members of that unit would come together to learn and to, you know, implement projects and things like that. And there was so much enthusiasm for this project and, you know, I just, nurses are so busy. They have so much to do and it's the word, their work is so critically important. Um, so, you know, I think it's just very understandable that um, in, in our case, they had to, um, just the workflow didn't make sense. They had to go to a, a different screen on the electric electronic health record than they normally would, right? And so I think we know whenever there's sort of like a, a push instead of a pull, right? Like it's just, it makes it so difficult. Um, and so I think that was really, um, you know, one of the things that became clear. So I don't know that it was particularly a surprise, but to to hear them say, this is valuable. And also it's just so not practical for us to open a whole other, you know, what's called a flow sheet to record the information. That was really um, clear. And I think what was great too about that is, you know, hearing it from, the bedside clinicians, it helped give us, um, I guess, you know, the gravitas to be able to go to the powers that be that will allow for these changes to happen, you know, with the electronic health record in our system to say, you know, this is really coming from the people on the ground, um, you know, to give them something that would help them and then would ultimately help the patients. Um, sorry, this just reminds me of another um, situation where it was another screen that got in the way. And in this case, it was nurses in the OR having to go between a screen that told them, you know, where everybody was on in terms of triage and another screen to see if there was an open bed. And because it was a separate screen, they, um, you know, it delayed patients getting admitted. So in your case, once again, the different screen was uh, as an impediment and, um, what did you, I'm just curious, how did you get around that separate screen? So we heard from, it, it was really one of those amazing things where we went to the unit, um, we did a mobile focus group. We tried to do a focus group, 
no one showed up, <laughs> which also was not so surprising because again, bedside nurses are at the bedside. They're not on Zoom doing focus groups, you know? Um, so they were exactly where they should be. So we went there. We went to the busy ICU. It was me and a, um, a critical care pulmonologist and another chaplain working on our project. And, you know, when people were in a moment where they weren't like, you know, administering critical medication or something like that, we would stop them and we would say, hey, we've got this prize wheel here. We have a question for you about this project. <laughs> you know, um, do you know about it? What's getting in the way of you doing it? Um, and they got to spin a little prize wheel and get some chips or, you know, little plants or chocolate or whatever. And really over and over and over again, probably from about 10 people, they said, you know, they pointed out this issue with the, it's another screen and they all, and when we asked where should it go, there was just like a uniform response about this is the one, this is the flow sheet we all need to use every day. And so this is the best shot of, um, of actually implementing it. Um, that's awesome. I don't see many projects where there's a universal response about exactly <laughs> right. what's supposed to happen, but yeah. that's so great. That's great. Well done. I think uh, what's also interesting about this project is that, and I see this a lot, and I'm sure Elizabeth sees it as well, you know, it's easy to to make a complicated process. It's harder and more work to simplify a process. And what you did really was to go and talk to them, find out, you know, the problem. They pointed right to the solution. They said, if you want me to do this, put it here. Mm -hmm. And you guys said, okay. And you, 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 I think the, I don't know how hard it is now, but I know that sometimes that would be a monumental effort to have that changed in IT or what have you. Now I have a question for you. What was your original countermeasure that you said, if I had just gone and done that, maybe I wouldn't have solved the problem. Yeah. The original countermeasure was like an educational program for staff to explore their own you know, reflective practice and spirituality. And I don't even think anyone would know what that meant. <laughs> you know, um, it made sense to me, but um, I think it's just, you know, we had to sort of show before we could, you know, that that's just sort of the best way, I think, to, to teach. And it made it real for people. But yeah, that was our, yeah. <laughs> that's what we thought we might want to do. Yeah. And I'm glad you changed it because that's considered training and that wouldn't count as a black belt project. Right. <laughs> that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um no that's a great very point. cool and, so yeah. what i'm sorry go ahead elizabeth no no tracy you go so um what did the other chaplains think of your project because you know you did have support and your boss was there too so that was lovely to see the the support that you had and they were very complimentary what feedback did you get from from your from them on your black belt project yeah um Part of it was from the folks that came, they um, they themselves have done, they've been in the process themselves. Like one of them has a green belt, one of them has a black belt. So that's really nice to just have that as part of the culture of our, of our department and to be able to use those tools and speak that language. Um, and then, you know, some of the other ones I think were, were curious and um, there is a, um, I, you know, it, 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 there is a lot of work to be done. And I know that, you know, some other like um, similar disciplines feel the same, but there's a lot of work to be done in explaining what it is we are doing um, in spiritual care, like that we know we can see the importance and we, you know, we see it in our patient interactions every day, but how do you, how do we explain that? in terms that um, our administrators who are extremely supportive, but you know, when they need to be making decisions about staffing and budget and things like that, how can we make it really plain for them? And I think that's what, you know, some of the feedback that I got from the team that they, they understood um, in a new way that it was all part of, you know, kind of that messaging, right. That sort of interpreting that we do um, about, you know, sort of the value, the value of the work. Mm -hmm. Um. I do want to come back to something you mentioned, which has kind of caught my ear, because I know, like you said, people in healthcare, if they're doing their job, a lot of them, if they're um, primary care, they're doing their job right, they're super busy <laughs> and, and they're with patients. So um, I love that you developed this uh, prize wheel. And I was just curious, are you feeling like this is kind of now part of your toolkit? Is that when you when you're going to be working with folks and you really need to um, get in there, get some feedback, get some information, um, and and you know you're taking precious time, 
Is that prize wheel going to come back? Is that going to make another appearance? <laughs> I think so. You know, and I think it's really just the like the extra courage that it gives me, you, you know, I, I understanding that everyone's so busy and also just as chaplains, you know, we are trained to be effective, but to do so in a way that is as little disruption to no disruption as possible. So like, for instance, when there is a code blue, right, when someone has a cardiac arrest or they stop breathing in the hospital, chaplains go. Um, but you may not know that because we're sort of trained to be, you know, to hang back and to find who's grieving, who's worried. And, you know, and so we're really trained to sort of like be present, but also, you know, not interfere. And so I think this really, um, the prize reel, wheel really helps me feel more courageous about, you know, going up to the units and, you know, with, with like appropriate, <laughs> you know, giving them space and again, not interfering with, you know, serious medical care um, to be able to realize that actually, I think the bedside nurses for the most part, were really happy to talk to us about this and that we could accomplish it. You know, I don't, I think these conversations probably happened in five minutes or less, but the, but all of the data that we got, even from those conversations were so, you know, we're still even, you know, kind of analyzing how we can implement those. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think the prize wheel is great. <laughs> uh, it's so interesting, your description of if you're doing your job right, it, you're stealth, right? People aren't super aware of you. You're trying to be unobtrusive. You're trying to figure, suss out the situation without asking a lot of questions or being um, highly visible. And that's an interesting counterpoint to what we're often encouraging people to, you know, go to the Gemba and watch. Actually, if they were really quiet and observing, then they would see what happened. But that's a situation that is can be chaotic. And mm -hmm. um, it's it's not something where people are going to watch somebody that's um, working the periphery. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And part of what I really appreciate it, and I hope my, you know, our team of chaplains appreciates too, is that um, this is, you, you know, Different chaplains have different ways of doing this, but you know we're not necessarily the best at the self promotion or the marketing our service. And you know, but to be able to like lean into lean into the lean, lean into the methodologies, you know, it sort of gives us that you know that it isn't just that we're like promoting ourselves. It's actually we're looking at you know um, looking at the data and we're being able to tell that like I said, you know, tell that story in a different way. So I think it really is a nice tool. Um, for folks who who may not know exactly how to you know paint that picture, that's mm -hmm. a great description. And sharing results, sharing the impact. Mm -hmm. To your point, painting that picture, telling your story, those are all really critical to a transformational lean culture. So anyway, that's that's exciting. That's cool. I'm glad you found mm -hmm. those ways to get in there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, gosh, that was a fast interview. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience, Allison? I guess I would just say that, you know, I think the word efficiency and spiritual care may not seem like they're related, but I, I just feel like there is so much important work to be done, so much meaningful work. We know we know the amounts of suffering that's happening in this world and, you know, everything that healthcare has been going through for a long time, but especially the last four years. And it just seems to me that if we have tools that, um, you, you know, allow the integrity of the work to happen and also increase the efficiency, it just almost seems like it would be like an ethical issue to not, <laughs> to not use these tools. So, yeah. um, you know, just kind of, um, excited to to bring those worlds together. And I would just remind our listeners, it's two sides of a coin, right? There's efficiency and effectiveness. And so you're addressing both of those. And you're saying, you know, we want to be more efficient about it, get to people faster, get to the people that need us um, in uh, at, a, at a higher level. But we also want to be effective, you know, in, to, in terms of what you bring and the impact you have on people. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a definitely an incredible combination. I agree. And I'd like to add a sec, a third E and that is emotion, <laughs> mm. right? So, you know, Elizabeth and I have both lost a parent recently. And so we had to go through the whole hospital situation and it is about process and it is, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved in that and it's not always recognized, but it is a very important part of, 
the whole self, the whole person. And, you know, I think that's what I love about process improvement in healthcare is they're very, you know, these processes and these, these things that happen in health are so emotional for people, um, you know, because it could involve someone passing and, and then there's, you know, sadly and unfairly all kinds of processes you have to now do because someone has passed. I've just been through it. Elizabeth's been through it. And just knowing that there are screenings for how are you feeling about this? And, and do you need some support emotionally? And sometimes I feel like people don't think it's not okay to ask that or, or you know, because they're so involved in the process. So I really appreciate your work. I agree with you. I think there's so much work to be done. And I wanted you on this podcast because I want people to see that really processes exist everywhere, yeah. even in spiritual care. Hey, that rhymes. We should use that as a tagline. <laughs> yes, Tracy, that's it. I wrote it down. Um, so if people wanted to reach out to you, um, would they uh, be easiest on LinkedIn or where do you like people to yeah. How would they contact you? LinkedIn is great. And um, we do have a website for our spiritual care department as part of the UCSD um, program. We also have a, a chaplain training program and internship that has a website as well. Also part of the, the UC, UC um, San Diego health website. So that's, that's how you can get to me and to us. Awesome. We'll put all those links um, that you just described on the site. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you. And thank you both for, um, you know, just make, making the world a more lean place. <laughs> <laughs> it's our job. It's our job. <laughs> you a link to register for our March 21st webinar, Game On, Unlocking Lean Innovation Through Deliberate Play, with guest host Marie Genevieve Pollack of Prime Alchemy. She'll showcase the powerful role of deliberate play in fostering creative problem solving, innovation, and process improvement. And she's an awesome presenter. So do not miss that. I'm so looking forward to that. Stay tuned for the re-release of our book, Problem Solvers Toolkit, coming out so very soon. The cover reel is in the works, and we're going to keep you posted on the relaunch. And you're in for a treat next month when we celebrate our 100th episode with Mark Rabin and Jamie Flinchbaugh of the Lean Whiskey Podcast, right? What an awesome synchronicity going on there with the cafe and the whiskey. So we're bringing the boys and some whiskey cocktails to the cafe in April. So do not miss our 100th episode celebration. Stay tuned for all the news by joining our community at the Just In Time Cafe. Yes, we are going to have cocktails, but you don't have to be 21 to listen to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks for joining me and Tracy. You are our favorite thing about the Just In Time Cafe. And we look forward to being your lifelong learning partners. Join us every month for your jolt of lean caffeine.